It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Nicole Lewis, who's another professor at the Astronomy Department, but also at the Earth and Atmospheric Science Department, and one of the experts in the whole world of characterizing planets around other stars. Well, thank you all. It's, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to sort of lead off of what Lisa's already told you and, and talk a little bit about how we're using the James Webb Space Telescope, the most biggest telescope we've ever put into space, to sniff uh, exoplanet atmospheres and figure out what they're made of. But I wanted to first start uh, with a little homage here. Um, more than a decade ago, I was among uh, the first few classes of Sagan Fellows. Um, so this was a new fellowship that uh, NASA had put forward, and they formed this fellowship to help uh, sort of launch the careers of people who are interested in studying exoplanets and for the search for life. Now, myself and my colleagues in this picture here have all gone on um, to actually uh, be faculty and researchers at various other places. Uh, but I just want to say that this was transformational for me and my career, and I am thankful that I can call myself a Carl Sagan Fellow. So as an exoplanetary scientist, I spend my time thinking about how to answer the questions, how did we get here? As in, how did the solar system form and how did the Earth get come to be and of course come to host life? And of course that leads to then, are we alone? How many other times did the magic that created our solar system and of course gave rise to the Earth occur in other places in our galaxy and beyond? Now, as Lisa mentioned, we've now found nearly 6,000 confirmed exoplanets with thousands more that are just waiting to be, you know, told they're not false, false positives. But what I want to highlight is that this field really is quite young. We detected the first exoplanet around a sun-like star in 1995. I think most of the people in this room were probably alive then. I, okay, yeah. Um, so you've lived through the detection of the first exoplanets. The first, we've always known that there should be planets around other stars, but now we have confirmed it. And what we've found is that, in fact, uh, exoplanets don't look a lot like the planets in our solar system. We found that the, most of the exoplanets that we know of to date are, in fact, planets that are unlike anything in our solar system. They are about the size of somewhere in between Earth and Neptune, and we call them sort of mini-Neptunes or super-Earths. This came out of the Kepler mission, but now we know that there are lots of planets out there for which we don't have solar system analogs, and that's really opened our minds into thinking about how we study planets beyond our solar system and extend the context of what we understand from the planets we live and, and live near. Now, it's great that we know that there's 6,000 exoplanets, but I want to go beyond just saying, hey, there's exoplanets, and I want to know what are they made of and what is their air like? We want to know if they're big hunks of rock or iron, are they big gas balls? And then we want to know, you know, what is in their air? Is there something indicative of potentially their surfaces being habitable or in fact inhabited? Now, I spent my early career working with data from the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. Both of these missions were launched well before we had 6,000 exoplanets. They were never designed to do this type of science. And so myself and others like me have spent a lot of time sort of retrofitting uh, our observational strategies and also the data from these space telescopes to learn a lot about exoplanets. In particular, we've been focused on planets that are sort of the size of Jupiter but orbit very close to their host stars. We lovingly refer to these as hot Jupiters. And so we were able to study hundreds of these types of planets and some smaller ones as well uh, with the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescope. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, we were able to actually think about how to observe these worlds well before the telescope launched. And so we were prepared to hit the ground running uh, with the launch of JWST. And now with the increased capabilities of JWST, we are likely going to look at more than 300, possibly 500 or even 1,000 planets in great detail and understand what they're made of and what their air is like. Now, I got the best Christmas present I could have ever got on December 25th, 2021, and that was the 
perfect, more than perfect launch of JWST. Uh, the launch was so perfect that the mission now looks to have a 20-year lifetime. And so this is something that I'm really excited to be doing for the rest of my career. And so with JWST, one of the first things uh, that the telescope looked at as part of the early release observations was the hot Jupiter WASP-96b. Now, this system was uh, selected, it was in the right place at the right time, but it's also one we've studied before. And we were able to actually capture the event where the planet passes in front of its host star as seen from Earth. And so what you see is a dip in the light from the combined system, so this is the relative brightness uh, as a function of time. And from this dip in the light, we can actually, just from simple circular geometry, figure out how big this planet is. Now we already knew how big this planet was. We knew it was a Jupiter. And so what we wanted to do was actually to take that light we had just measured and spread it out into a rainbow. There are a lot of spectrographs on JWST and they allow us to take that light and to assign it to different wavelength ranges that then allow us to sort of sniff the atmosphere to figure out if the atmosphere has things like sodium or potassium or maybe sulfur species, carbon dioxide and water. And so using JWST, we spread that light out we got from WASP-96b. And so these are those observations. And in spreading the light out, we were able to see, again, these absorption features that, that Lisa mentioned before. And we know that these are all due to water in the atmosphere. Now, we weren't surprised that there was water in the atmosphere. We kind of knew that that's what we should see. But what we were more surprised about was the precision with which we were able to measure those water features. 200 parts per million is what we're measuring here. This is a five times improvement from what we were able to do with the Hubble Space Telescope. We are looking at tiny, tiny drops in a very large bucket in order to make these measurements. Now, JWST not only looks at planets as they pass in front of their host stars, they also take pictures of planets. Um, there are several coronagraphs on the James Webb Space Telescope, and these instruments block out the light of the star, which is very, very bright, so that we can see the fainter planet next to it. And so here we have some pictures taken of the planet HIP 65426b in different wavelength ranges. And so we can measure the different colors of this planet. And that, again, tells us something about what's in its atmosphere and also its temperature. We can again look at these planets um, where we can take pictures and then spread out their light. And so one of the early observations with JWST was of a what we call a directly imaged exoplanet. And we were able to spread its light out and detect everything from water to carbon monoxide to methane to these silicate features right here. So these planets uh, have clouds in them, but they aren't clouds like the ones you see outside. These are clouds made of rock. This was also the first time that we were able to successfully detect carbon and sulfur-bearing species in exoplanet atmospheres. And so one of the first things we started to see as we spread this light out from different exoplanets is that there were these booming features out here in the infrared from carbon dioxide, and then right next to it is the sulfur dioxide. Now, the carbon dioxide was not totally unexpected, although it, it has shown up in a lot more places than we thought, but we did not expect to see these sulfur-bearing species. And this is indicative of photochemistry happening in these planets' atmospheres. It's also great if we want to go hunting for volcanoes on these planets. Now, coming back to those rock clouds, one of the things we were able to do early with JWST was to look in this very particular region of, of light, this wavelength of light, where the silicon and oxygen in these rock species actually do a little dance, as they say. And we were able to detect, in fact, very, very small snowflakes of quartz in the atmosphere of the hot Jupiter WASP-17b. And so in other worlds, you aren't going to have a white Christmas from, say, water or ice, but you're going to have a white Christmas from quartz crystals falling from the sky. Now, going beyond sort of these giant planets, these hot Neptunes, we've been able to look at smaller planets, again, these sub-Neptunes, the most numerous type of planet that exists out there in our galaxy. And again, we've been able to detect a broad range of spe species, including methane, carbon dioxide, and then start to see hints of these things like dimethyl sulfide, 
which is thought to be a biosignature in many contexts. So again, we're starting to see key signatures of perhaps biology uh, in these atmospheres of these sub-Neptune, these gas giant worlds. And finally, we've started to look at, in fact, Earth-sized planets. So this is observations of a planet that's only just slightly larger than Earth. It is quite a bit warmer. Um, but what we've been able to do is, again, spread that light out and take a peek into its atmosphere. And so what we're seeing right now is, again, we're, we're trying to distinguish whether this planet is uh, water-rich in its atmosphere, so maybe having a lot of steam around it, or if we're still seeing signatures of the star uh, imprinted onto this planet's atmosphere. There are hundreds of hours of observations with JWST that are devoted to looking at Earth-sized planets orbiting primarily small M dwarf stars, hoping that we get some idea of what's in their atmospheres. And so while we don't have a definite detection of a atmosphere around an Earth-sized planet with JWST, that is coming sooner than you may think, so stay tuned. And so JWST, just in the first three years of observations, has really revolutionized exoplanet science and is helping us take those next steps to really answering that question, are we alone in the universe?